Good morning, everyone. We will now reconvene in open session. We'll begin with commissioner's comments, reports and comments. Yeah, Vice well, President I, Baker. Yeah, I have nothing today. Thank you. I have two quick things, if I can mention. Um, one is I know uh, in recent days we received an invitation to tour Rose Hill Manor, the historic home in Williamsport, and I would like to see if we could um, take the owner up on her offer to tour the home. Um, in my conversation, not directly with her, but with the understanding certainly that when we meet as a group of five commissioners, it would have to be open to the public, so there would be the public. Rose Hill Manor. Rose Hill Manor. On um, in Williamsport, I'm not sure the address. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and she was certainly amenable to the fact that we would all be there. Certainly, um, our local media would be invited. And we also have an upcoming meeting with our historical advisory committee. Oh, go ahead. I don't know if that's been scheduled yet, but if we could work those out in conjunction together, the owner of the property, Mrs. Hershey, is an outgoing member of the historical advisory committee. So I think that would be a nice um, gesture to her as well. Um, Give her a certificate of recognition. Is that what you I think, think that would be great? Yeah, I think that would be fine. One location. And if you go down about a quarter mile, delightful dairies on the left. <clears throat> That'll be stop number two. Put that for a commercial. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, one more thing, if if I could. We would schedule that for a commissioner day. I, I think that would make sense. A Tuesday commissioner day. Um, have that first thing we do or the last thing we do in the day. But yeah. Okay, Wayne. One more item. I was also contacted by um, Judy Fiery who lives in the Searfoss community. And there is a, an upcoming public service commission hearing concerning um, the solar project that's planned for their neighborhood. And there were two requests that came from their neighborhood and I would like to see if we could meet those requests. One is to possibly ask for a postponement of the hearing that's scheduled in the very near future. Hopefully that would give time for our planning commission to um, make some recommendations on solar projects and their placement. Um, but if that would not be possible or also, certainly also, that we have a right as the local board of county commissioners to take part in those meetings with the public service commission. We don't have a vote, but we can take part in those meetings and we can invite them here. And I would like to do that for this project and actually all future projects. Um, it's important for this community and I would like us to be a part of that. So if we could, I'm not sure how that process would work. It would be a first time for our county in doing so. If we could direct county staff to um, help arrange that joint hearing, I think that would be fantastic. I concur. I think it, especially we can get the postponement and get our solar ordinance in before that. I think that would be fantastic for the county. You're okay with the yeah, post, um, postponement? Guess, Is that what you're... Yeah, I wanted to ask Rob a question on the Public Service Commission. Uh, how do we go about finding out who the members are are any of the, maybe I um, don't expect you to know, but are any of the members of the Public Service Commission from Washington County? Not that I'm aware of, but I can get that list to you. But they're making decisions for Washington County. In fact, we met one of the, I believe it was the chairman at MACO. Mm -hmm. I know he's not from Washington County, but I can get you the other names fairly quickly. So just to summarize, the request was to have a joint hearing with the... Or you First, you want to ask for a post, we're able to ask for a postponement is what I wrote. That's correct. If we can have, um, request a postponement, if the Public Service Commission would be amenable to that, to give us time for our planning commission to um, put forth some recommendations to us for consideration. And then part two of that um, would be, even if the postponement is not granted, the public hearing that they do hold in our county, they're required to hold the meeting in, in our county, and we have the right to request to be a part of that hearing. So I certainly would like that to happen. Coordinator, uh, by a part, we can assign someone to sit with the commission. I think, I think we can do that. Commission can sit with them. <coughs> I think we can do that. But we don't have a vote. I thought, I thought uh, she said that we, we were even uh, in a position where we could chair the meeting. Um, one attorney uh, has made that interpretation. Um, I, I'm not sure of the validity of that, but... That was Mr. Downey, you have any comments on that? I mean, it's obviously an opportunity that is required to be afforded to the local governing body by the Public Service Commission. It's statutes. Um, from a political perspective, I'm not sure whether the commissioners want to avail themselves of that opportunity when they don't have any um, ultimate authority to necessarily make the decision. Uh, you'll be seen as being in, in front of the room. It'll appear to be one of your hearings. Um, 
but ultimately you won't have control over the final outcome. Certainly that could put us in an awkward situation. I don't think any of us signed up for an easy job when we decided to run for office and there are citizens and if we can advocate for them even if we don't have a decision to render, I think that's important. You may also want to consider obviously there are a number of these that are going to be coming up and if there are some type of standard as to when the commissioners wish to participate, whether they are going to be participating in all of these things or only in some, and if only in some, then how do you decide which ones require your attendance and which do not? That's a great point. This would be our first time joining a meeting, so some bugs to work out. That's all I have. All right, we'll take it under consideration. It's a good point, okay? All right, Mr. Wagner, comments. Uh, morning. Uh, yeah, Wayne. I would. Uh, I would think that with our planning commission trying to set some recommendations to the public service commission, that might might help. The postponement. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to verdicts out. I'm going to analyze what court. Uh, what the attorney said about you know being there because we sort of do set a precedence. But then again, you had a good point. You still fighting for the people who asked us to fight. So, so I got to hear more about that. Uh, I already said good morning. So, oh, there's the students back there. Look at them all. One, two, three, four, five. Are they teachers? I'm getting old, so they all look young to me. <laughs> but uh, welcome. Michelle, thank you for engineering this. I had requested that when I first got elected. That some, I actually requested it as a, a student serve up here with us as a student representative, but sort of got to start getting complicated. You have to get out of school, and then uh, <coughs> Dr. Michael get mad at me, and just a lot of things going on. So Michelle's doing a good job. You just hang with Michelle, and everything will be fine. Uh, what else? I had a couple functions this week, uh, Hagerstown Area Pregnancy Clinic fundraiser at Fountainhead. It was, it was a nice function, good speaker, guy from uh, maybe Alabama. He had his accent, so it could have been somewhere. Was it Alabama? Yeah, yeah, Court was there, and uh, and Jeff was there actually. So, uh, well, Jeff's everywhere. But anyway, it was a good function. Good function. It was a fundraiser. You got your meal free, but it was a pretty expensive meal because then they come around and wanted money. So, uh, oh, Hagerstown area, uh, Washington chicken was voted the best chicken sandwich. Actually, our comptroller Peter Franchot will be there today, uh, and. Uh, Give them some kind of a recognition, I guess. And uh, I think that's it for me. Anybody have birthday today in here? No. I, I try to keep up on the birthdays. Welcome, Greg Snook. So thank you. Thank you, Court. Um, I, I guess I just want to concur uh, with Commissioner Kiefer. I think it would be uh, imperative that we try to postpone it and get the Planning Commission and ordinance set before that because um, from everything we've heard that they will take that into consideration. And I'm... I think, you know, I don't want to rush it along, but I think we, if we can try to get that before that the, the planning commission meeting it would, it would definitely help our case. Anything else? That's it. All right, just a couple of things. Um, on a sad note, a gentleman by the name of Ray Gladhill, 70 years of age, passed away over the weekend. If I recall right, he was a 30-year county highway employee retiring back in 2009. So just keep his family and, uh, and your thoughts and prayers for the Gladhill family. I did attend the Commission on Aging groundbreaking for the Fit Lot device. It was a exercise device for seniors to participate in and stay healthy and strong. And it was attended by one of the, um, I guess, regional ARP leaders, if that's correct. Um, I did also attend the Cumberland Valley breast cancer event out at HCC, uh, my mom was a double breast cancer survivor till Alzheimer's won the battle, and also attended the CMB bank opening out on the dual highway, and CMB continues to be a contributing partner, uh, providing loans for small businesses uh, that helps our economic development. And the other thing I want to bring to the commissioner's attention, don't really want to sign an um, agreement today, but I want to bring to attention the email and the letter about Bruce Berriano representing us again as a lobbyist to assist court and the county directly in Mako. 
So um, with that being said, that concludes. Yeah, I, uh, I have one other mm -hmm. request or information I'd like to have. Uh, when a letter to the county commissioners is sent to the county office, what's the process of getting it to the county commissioners? Uh, so uh, actually, Michelle is our mail person in the county administration office, and then it is distributed typically to the county clerk for recordation, and then it's distributed to U.S. commissioners. When I get one, I forward it to Krista, and then she just sent And it. we obviously receive every letter that's uh, addressed to the county commissioners. And I guess there was a letter addressed to the county commissioners, and then one of our staff members uh, addressed the, the letter back to the uh, person that sent the letter to us. A citizen sent a letter. Yeah. So I didn't know if that was protocol or... Uh, it shouldn't be each of you should get anything addressed to the commissioners or the board you should each okay. receive, yes. So I'd be glad to look into it if there's more detail okay. on that. Thank you. If I comment, I didn't know we were talking about uh, Bruce Barriano. I know with the uh, Medicaid uh, EMS reimbursement, um, I've already been working with him at the summer MAKO, um, getting contacts and, and starting working on that. And uh, I think it would definitely help us with MAKO, Bruce, and our coalition on working with as many delegates and state senators um, to get support for the Medicaid reimbursement uh, for the EMS. So. Commissioners, do you want to make a decision on that today? I, I don't, without seeing a, a bill, I don't think it's appropriate, but. I think he said 10,000, was that the letter you distributed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was 10,000. Yeah. Well, again, a lot of the things that you're addressing down there at uh, MAKO, I think that should be our delegation's responsibility, totally. Uh, they're going to be the ones voting on it. I think they're going to be the ones uh, working with their colleagues uh, to try to get uh, the uh, the amount of money that the companies are allowed to bill for increased, I think that's directly going to be the responsibility of our delegation and senators. Well, I, I agree, but as we all know, you need to go down and lobby and have people down there and get our, our EMS down there and talk yeah. to people and get, get support for it. Because if it's just our delegation, um, we, need, we need support. We can't just have our delegation down there. Well, so under that, then that means support. we won't support the Washington County Lobby that's, Coalition either. That's, they're the ones that are going to be part of our uh, lobbying group. If we're going to support the uh, the local group, then that should be uh, on their agenda to be down there working uh, uh, working on our behalf for that request also. I would I would say if that our community lobbying coalition does a fine job for us, and they also have contacts that we can reach out to, not just day in Annapolis, but all year long. I've had some issues that I've gone to our coalition group to ask for help and support on, and I've, I've received everything that I've asked for as an alternative. Um, I think Mr. Barion is a fine man. Um, I did see an article in a recent Annapolis newspaper, I believe he represented the most number of clients as a lobbyist this last year. Um, second largest in revenues, I believe, in fees collected, but the, the largest number of clients represented. And I do just have to wonder, not all of those clients are going to agree on all the issues. So how, how might that, you know, impact if we have an issue we would like him to take up or advocate for us, but someone else, another county or another jurisdiction he might represent has a conflicting um, request. So. Um, I think we've had a good experience with our local lobby and coalition group, and I, I would prefer we stick with them only. Any other comments? I think we should hold off at this point, but let's... I think we'll settle that vote for that later. Next, we have other reports from county staff. Rob, Sarah? I think we may have some in the next... Any, any other county staff would like to come forward? Good morning, Deborah Kondo, Deputy Director of Human Resources. And good morning, Rachel Brown, Director of Human Resources. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I'm here today requesting an official vote authorizing the request for advertising for the Structural Engineer number 166 position. This is a position grade 15, step one. $59,634 a year position in engineering, 
Department code is 11620. The location is in the administrative annex. It's an exempt position, regular full time. We are requesting both internal and external advertising. A job description has been provided. This is for position 166 and job code 570. It is a position that's been budgeted and the position will report to the Director of Engineering, Scott Hobbs. It's a 40 hour per week position and this is to replace John Van Ripper who resigned September 27th, 2019. Commissioners? I, I motion to accept the advertising. I'll second. To allow the advertising. <laughs> first and a second, and will Rachel's first be accepted? Any other conversation, discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Congratulations. Thank one, you. One tidbit to add on that is Mr. Van Riper is now inspecting bridges like the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. So when he came to us with that, we didn't have any bridges of that size or nature for him to inspect to be that yeah. exciting. So yeah. not yet. Yes, that's right. <laughs> not yet. I want him to inspect the bridge down there in South Kent County that withstood all of the floods when all of the modern bridges washed away. And then I'm also requesting an official vote for authorization to hire for the role of planning and zoning director. That's in the planning and zoning division. It is a grade 18 step seven position with a salary of $87,090. The reason for the vacancy is the retirement of Stephen Goodrich, effective November 30th, 2019. This is a full-time position that's been budgeted. There was both internal and external advertising. We received a number of 16 applicants and three interviews were conducted, one internal and two external. And we recommend Jill Baker to the position of Director of Planning and Zoning. Would you like to comment? We haven't, we haven't informed. Okay. Commissioners? We haven't informed the other candidates, or all the candidates at this time. Have you done that? They all have not been contacted yet. I, I, I do apologize. I suggest we wait. Yep. Thank you. Anything else? That's all. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other county staff? Ashley, come forward. Name, please, department. Good morning, commissioners. Ashley Holloway, director of plan review and permitting. I come before you this morning uh, asking for your vote of approval for two positions within my division. They are new positions, but they are replacing existing budgeted positions due to resignation, promotion, and uh, retirement. So we're just doing a slight restructuring of the division. Um, I spoke to you last week about these in closed session, so now I bring it for you for a vote of open session. Just to remind you, the first position is a planner position. Uh, this would be replacing a plan reviewer position. It will be at a grade 12 step one salary of $47,341. And the second position is uh, permit and zoning liaison. This will be uh, replacing the soon to be retired zoning coordinator position. And I just wanna give uh, thanks and appreciation to Kathy Crowboth, who's been with the county for 30 years. She'll be retiring at the end of the year. Uh, she's done great work. It was a pleasure to work with her, and I'm sorry to see her leave. But uh, we want to uh, retweak her position to be more of a liaison position, more of a face for the customers, and have a definite person to go to for zoning and permit questions instead of either myself or a permit tech or uh, Becky Gander, who is the chief of permitting. So this will be the sole person for the public eye of the division when it comes to these type of zoning and permit questions. And that's also at a grade 12 step one salary of $47,341. So grade 12, we don't need a vote, correct? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Staff, any other staff like to come forward? Please introduce yourself. Sure. Um, good morning, Commissioners. Michelle Dwyer, Administrative Support Specialist for the County. I have the honor of introducing the students participating in student government today. The students are going to have the opportunity to meet with the several departments to learn about how the government functions and ask some questions about different career paths with the government. So as I say your name, students, please stand up for me. Okay. Um, Haley Daniels from Smithsburg High School. Hi, Haley. Catherine McKean from North Hagerstown. Blessings Moses from South Hagerstown. 
Maureen Rafter from Williamsport. Talia Castle from Barbara Ingram School of Fine Arts. And William Albowitz from Clear Spring High School. Albowitz. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioners. Oh, oh, hold on a second. Commissioners, sure. any comments for Michelle or the students? Or students, you have a comment for the commissioners? I think they're all very excited to be here today. I can tell you they've been very engaging this morning. A lot of great questions. So the rest of the day should be fun-filled excitement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. President Klein. I believe Mr. Kaufman is here and would like a photo. Oh, if we Kaufman. could oblige him a photo with the commissioners and Team the students, photo, if please that okay? Forward. Yeah, is that okay, that. Oh, that's... Wheel. Over there. See, and they thought they were Jeff's gonna... never turned down a photo. Quick question, President Klein. Sure. Um, I know we talked about the postponement. Does that need to be an official vote that we ask for postponement for the uh, solar for the PCS or PSC? Sorry, Public so, Service Committee. I think we agreed to have a consensus to move forward with asking for the postponement. I, I did we know really, really need, need a vote on that? And I think we yielded for Kirk for more advice on how to attend and set that up legal to be a member or participating. So, if I sum up. The I just didn't know if we had a vote on that to, to, uh, for a postponement or not. Uh, that's, I guess, was my question. We have a consensus to send a letter to request the postponement. Then, then I'll make the motion to postpone the PSC uh, awaiting our uh, planning commission's uh, ordinance. There's a I will second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The letter for postponement. Okay. okay. Um, any other staff? To participate, please come forward. Um, commissioners, I have the Washington County Environmental Management Advisory Committee wishing to make two reappointments. Um, they're looking to reappoint Rebecca Beecroft and Dennis Cumby to each serve a first full three year term through September 30th of 2022. This will be their each. First full term, um, their first term was a year. It was staggered due to the committee being formed and terms were staggered. So they each only served a year, which does not count towards their um, membership terms required <coughs> in the county policy. Motion to approve. Is there a second? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Additionally, we have the Washington County Electrical Board of Examiners and Supervisors wishing to reappoint Daniel Sterling to serve a second two year term as a member at large through October 31st of 2021. This is a paid board. Is there a motion to support? Make the motion. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Administrator Rob Slocum. I do not. All right, any other staff wishing to come forward? If not, we'll go to citizens participation and please be mindful, try to keep your information to about three to five minutes, and all due respect intended. I'll be short. Thank you. Please introduce yourself again for the record. And Roger thank Vincent. You, thank you for your understanding. David McDonough. 
I'd like to start today. Um, I'd like to give you some history about what we've been doing with this tax, uh, mobile home or the trailer camp tax, whatever you, the uh, residents of Lakeside Village have uh, a residence association and I'm the president of that and have been on and off for the last 10 years. <clears throat> the, um, we started out by doing little things and we felt that the smaller we started, it was easier to just get the easy things. So we started with the $4.50 that Lakeside charges us to, to uh, read our uh, water meters and send us a bill. They do that every quarter. And we felt that that by when we read the law about uh, public utilities not being able to add on to it, we felt that, that they owed us that $4.50. $4.50 times 500 units four times a year over 10 years. Bunch of money. Okay? Uh, so we, we didn't know how to go about it. So we started by talking to the managers. Got nowhere. So we talked to the regional manager, Mary Walker, who's out of Virginia, Winchester, Virginia, and their, their um, mobile home park there. The owners own, uh, we understand, five mobile home parks. Okay, they have, um, they got back to us and we had a meeting with her and it went nowhere. She was gonna go back and find out, never responded. Um, so we went from there to um, her uh, state delegation. <clears throat> we talked to Neil Parrott and he was all, yay, yay, oh, that sounds great. And 30 days later, nothing, and then nothing and nothing. And then we talked with, um, we said, well, okay, let's try the Attorney General. We went to the Attorney General's office. We talked to the lady over here in the office um, down the street, and she said, oh, it sounds like you got a great deal going here. This is, sounds good. 30 days later, you don't have a thing to do. You've got no, nowhere to go. Uh, we got put, that was right in the middle of the election, by the way. And we felt that there was something going on there. <clears throat> okay, that's our supposition. So then Steve came up with the, the great idea to, to do, to come to you guys and talk about the tax itself. And that's where, that's where we're at. So we didn't just start in five weeks ago here. We've been going this for a long time. Now we're trying to get documentation for you uh, about the, um, to find out when Lakeside changed, if they did, changed from ta uh, taking their, their um, rental amount and adding the tax, which is what they do today. And according to the attorney, he said that that's not the way you do it. You're supposed to do it on the gross. Well, they're not doing it on the gross. You can plainly see that on their, their paperwork. So are we being taxed twice? Is the tax in the, the rent and then taxed on top of it? Boy, we'd sure like to know that. Because uh, we, we don't even want to pay tax once, let alone twice. So right now we're paying $60.66 a month, a month more than we think we should be paying. Um, that adds up to $799 a year. Wow. Uh, for all of us on... on um, Fixed income, that's a lot of money. Um, I, I teach um, to, to get a little extra money. I, I, I teach a homeschool, a young girl for a sixth grade, and we, I teach history. So that's why I just gave you a history lesson of what we did. Because if you, if you don't remember history, you will repeat it. So why are we repeating it by in this tax? The three counties, Howard, Anne Arundel, and Baltimore, have done away with this tax. They had it based on different things, um, and they paid different ways than we pay here. Um, all of which, I think, follow the tax. The way it's done here, I don't think, follows what the tax says. So if we're looking at the tax the way it's written, there's, a, there's some problems that you can address, and we hope you do, uh, to change the way that's done 
to make it make it pro, uh, tax if we're going to be taxed taxes properly, but we want the tax removed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Would you like to? Uh, thank you. Hey, um, you know, initially, Cam, I was hoping to uh, hear some report on maybe any activity that's been done on the uh, tax. Pardon me, would you any you discussions? Your name, name for the record. Uh, Stephen McDonough. And you were Roger Vincent. Okay, I think we might have had them mixed up. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Sorry, sir, for the interruption. Yes, I, I was hoping to have, uh, you know, someone at department head or someone or member of the council uh, bring us up to date on anything that may have happened or may any activity that's been taken on the tax. If it's all right, I'll. Um, I, I I agree with the, both of you. I, I I do not think the the. The tax is supposed to be from the gross amount and percentage of it's not a sales tax. It's not added to it. So I agree with that. We are looking into that. Um, I, I also I you know if we need to get on the agenda next week or the following time in our next meeting, um, I do think. I know you want the tax repealed. Um, I don't think that is uh, feasible or fair, um, and the reason why is everybody needs to. Be able to pay a tax and i personally i asked uh why can't you guys why can't the trailers be taxed like every other real property and there's a, a long involved process of why it can't be um even if we we were able to make it tax as real property it ends up becoming uh, a much bigger problem so if you'd like to go, if you want me to spend 20 minutes and, and explain that in detail i would love to do that um but i also do think that um Paying the tax as high as it are, like you said, that would be an $80,000 home. Um, I don't think that is fair, and I do think we need to come up to a, a fair and reasonable um, adjustment to that, and we're looking at a lot of different alternatives for that. Um, I, mean, I think we're preparing a public report in the near future. If certain things or information is received, you're going to see a public discussion about that, and we're going to make sure you're here. Okay. okay. That's good. Uh, the other, I'd like understand to add something we're to, on it. to that. Uh, um, there are very few, if any, $80,000 houses in Lakeside Village. Um, or in the I, county. I purchased, yeah, I purchased my unit, a double wide, um, 14 years ago for $74,000. <coughs> okay, they depreciate. So it ain't anywhere clear to that now. And across the street, I think it's the, one of the biggest houses, and it, she bought it for $83,000 15 years ago. And so there's no eighty thousand dollar units there, absolutely none. No, okay. Or like a lot of twenty five hundred dollar units. Thank you for your reminder. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But I, you know, I do realize that this tax is older than at least three of the members that are sitting here. Okay, and that you guys weren't even aware of the tax until five weeks ago. Which three? Huh? <laughs> I'm, be I'm guessing. You better be Kiefer. careful. Um, Wagner, Schmidt, Wagner. I volunteer my and name on that. Reeves. I'm guessing they're all younger than 56 years old. I graduated in high school the year before you made it. Okay. There you go, Rob. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, yes. <laughs> just, just, just please be mindful. Please be mindful. I, I, I will. here waiting behind you. Yeah, basically, uh, if I understand this right, this law was created in 1963 due to the changes in the state and local tax assessments and the way they're being done. Okay, and it, what it resulted in is the uh, council members uh, weren't getting enough in taxes, so they decided to uh, institute what is really a space tax uh, on the, on the uh, mobile homes, and uh, they did that to recover the loss by putting the burden onto the residents rather than the property owner. It, you know, in today's tax dollars, real tax dollars, the communities here are actually paying $61 million worth of real property taxes over the year. Now that's a tax that we don't own, we don't own a property on, we can't take it off of our taxes, all we can do is suffer through with it. at $61 million, okay? And I was wondering, has, have any of the council members actually gone through uh, and visited any of these communities? To see what they're like. Yes, if, I if, have. if you haven't, I would suggest you do. Commissioners can choose to respond or not. We normally 
don't. We've been very courteous. Oh, okay. Responses. So this is more for you to comment and for us to respond okay. later. And we are going to have this as a public discussion sometime. Okay. Soon. Thank you. Well, as a reminder, we started off five weeks ago. Since then, uh, the communities have uh, contributed $58,653 worth of uh, real property tax value. My personal contribution during the last five weeks has equaled almost $8,000 <coughs> in tax, real tax property. And just so you know, that's actually more than three times the value of what I purchased my home for. Okay. The lot that uh, my home, 650 square feet, equals 1 64th of an acre. Okay, the lot that they attributed to me, okay, consists of a total of one twelfth of an acre that includes my home. Okay, so that's a pretty expensive acre that you're collecting taxes on. Again, we're just asking that you uh, take and repeal this unfair and burdensome tax. Gentlemen, thank you again. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here for citizens participation? Please come forward. Seeing none, we'll move on to the presentation of proclamation for Mary Bodkin. Would you want to come forward, Mary, and sit down and let us grill you a couple dozen questions? And anybody else you have, Greg, uh, anybody in the library board would like to come up with me? Mary? Mr. Martin, all of you, please come forward. I get to sit? What do I do? What do I do? What do you want me to do? Well, just say hi, what your plans are doing, what are you looking forward to, how many years? And oh, well, thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to come before you today. I'm very honored. I have had the honor of being your um, library director for almost 25 years. I started when I was 12. <laughs> uh, and it is time now to, I think, pass the baton. I had a great run, particularly with the support of the commission and all of the communities that our libraries are in. Oh. I want to thank my board. Yeah, they're here. And also uh, my executive uh, assistant director, who's now director of public service, Kathy, who's been my right-hand person. I think some recent accomplishments, the library downtown, the library in Hancock. You should be very proud of those. I am. As I, I think all of the communities are proud of their libraries and the people who work so hard in the communities that gain those libraries. Greg, would you, anybody of the board like to comment? Can we postpone this? Yeah. Whoops. So she has been a, a real advocate, both not here, but also down at the county. And we're going to miss her, but we also want to say thank you so much, Mary, for all you've done. Any other board members like to comment? I just want to comment quickly on behalf of the Maryland State Library System. Uh, I'm honored to be chair of the Maryland State Library Board. Mary not only has done, had remarkable accomplishments here in Washington County, but she is known across the state. Her role with the state library system, the Maryland Library Administrators and <laughs> others has been instrumental in uh, working on making sure that the state legislature is aware of the system's needs across the state. And we have much stronger libraries, not just here in Washington County, but across the entire state of Maryland because of her advocacy work, chairing the Maryland Legislative Committee on Libraries and advocating for support not only here in our county, but throughout the whole state of Maryland. So Mary, thank you on behalf of the state. Over here. Okay. I'm following you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Board, we'll have 
Williamsport Library. And I think it was April 1935, 15 students were killed on a bus trip return from Washington, D.C. The members of the community went around with coffee cans, tin cans, collecting pennies to help raise that money to build that facility. And every day as a young kid, when I went to the library and I first top a table was the news article showing an empty classroom in the faces of all those children that were killed. And that library dedicated in their memory and still stands there as an edifice to honor them and memorialize the sacrifice of their lives. There's many of us up there that used to read a world book in Christ. So, anyway, but the library at Williamsport had an impact on my mom's life and mine as well. So, thank you for all your service to all the communities, to all the libraries. And we'll get that Williamsport Library worked on you here betcha. soon. You betcha. I'm holding you to it. So on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners, we'd like to issue this proclamation to Mary Bicon, a resolution of appreciation. Whereas Mary Bicon has upheld a tradition of innovation and commitment to excellent service at Washington County Free Library, and whereas she has ushered an age of connectiveness, and <clears throat> some tough words in there, <laughs> by the introduction of internet and accessible technology to Washington County, and whereas inspired us to look forward and embrace the possibilities with the construction and renovation of the Central Library and four branch libraries, and whereas during her 25 years at Washington County Free Library, she continuously demonstrated exemplary leadership at the local, state, and national levels to uphold ideals of librarianship with integrity. And whereas, by her selection as Librarian of the Year, how about a round of applause for that in 2007? She exemplifies dedication and excellence in the library profession, advocating for education, employment, entrepreneurship, engagement, empowerment for everyone, everyone in the county. Now, therefore, we, the Board of County Commissioners of Washington County, Maryland, to hereby extend Mary Bicon our sincere appreciation for her contributions to promoting literacy and growth in our community. We applaud her innovation, dedication, and excellence. Congratulations on 25 years to service the citizens of Washington County as their library director. Congratulations, thank you very much. Board and all join us up front for a picture with the commissioners. This is yours.
Next on our agenda, presentation of the Proclamation for Economic Development Week. As our business director team, people, folks come forward. Um, some brief comments about the week. Uh, commissioners, I believe Susan is over with the students now presenting what she does, so uh, Jonathan is here. Yes, I'm in, I'm in place. I am in place of the director. Jonathan Horowitz, Economic Development. Well, would you tell us about Economic Development Week and what's going on? Absolutely. Uh, this is a week that's recognized, the third week in October, that's recognized by the Maryland Economic Development Association. Uh, they proclaim this week to be Economic Development Week in the state of Maryland. It's celebrated across the state of Maryland, and each individual county takes it upon <laughs> themselves to celebrate and appreciate their local businesses. And our department this week, in celebration of our 60th year of the department, has uh, decided to put together a, a county tour with the help of our ambassadors from senior staff and other business leaders in the county. So Monday through Thursday this week, our team, with the help of the ambassadors, is visiting 60 of our local businesses to uh, express appreciation for their uh, uh, employment of our citizens and their contributions to our tax base. So we've been uh, out visiting uh, businesses so far this week, and uh, staff is currently out doing that right now. And we do appreciate the ambassador's help with that. Uh, the businesses have been uh, receiving us very well, and they appreciate the fact that we're recognizing their contributions to the business community in Washington County. Uh, the governor, Governor Hogan, last night at the uh, MEDA conference in Easton, Maryland, recognized this week and uh, provided a proclamation as well to MEDA for that event. Okay, next we have our proclamation. Is Susan on our way to help receive this, or? Yes, she's with the students, but I can see that she's... If not, we can just go ahead and proceed with the reading of the proclamation, and if she arrives, she'll join in. Okay. Uh, Randy, would you um, join, and team members, would you join over there with the reading of the proclamation? Gather around, gather around. I think you today, uh, where are you going with that microphone? I, don't know. I got it. It's like hit, it's like hitting a moving target. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have, do have a, a proclamation for Economic Development Week, and, and I appreciate everything you're doing. You guys are out there pounding the road, and uh, I'm going to try to get with you sometime this week. Whereas economic development efforts have and will continue to improve the economic well-being and quality of life of the county by helping to create and retain jobs that facilitate business growth and provide a stable tax base. And whereas economic development requires countywide teamwork with all government, workforce development, educational, private business, and various to her partners to be successful. And whereas the economic growth and stability of the state affects all regions and jurisdictions in Maryland and Washington County is an important component of the state's economic success and will highlight and promote economic development efforts in our county. Now, therefore, we, the Board of County Commissioners of Washington County, Maryland, hereby proclaim the week of October 20th to the 26th, 2019, as Ep Economic Development Week, recognizing all the past, current, and future efforts of all those to participate and support economic development, private and public efforts at all levels, federal, state, county, city, and municipality. Awarded this day, 22nd day of October 2019 by the Board of County Commissioners of Washington County. That going is Susan, you almost Sorry. missed it, but <laughs> I was talking to here was, if nobody knows Susan's our director of this. But anyway, thank you all and here you go, Susan. Oh, picture taken today.
Next on our agenda, request to abandon sanitary easement. Mr. Moser, please introduce yourself. Mark, welcome. Good morning, Todd Moser, Real Property Administrator with Mark Bradshaw, Deputy Director, Division of Environmental Management. Move to approve the abandonment of sewer easement located at 16144 Elliott Parkway in Williamsport. Maryland Papers requested the county abandon a sewer easement under their existing building of 16144 Elliott Parkway. The sewer easement being considered for abandonment was created when the business park was laid out at Elliott Parkway. When Maryland Paper was built, the sewer was constructed to the west of their property within a new easement area. Maryland Paper recently completed an expansion and the site plan showed the original easement had never been abandoned. Due to a new easement being created at an alternative location, the original easement is no longer needed and will have no impact on the county if abandoned. I motion to abandon the sewer easement. Second. First and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Subdivision of Fort Ritchie Community Center. Please introduce yourself and the matter. Todd Moser again here with Andrew Eshelman, Director of Public Works. Move to approve the Subdivision of Fort Ritchie Community Center. The Department of Plan and Review has approved the Subdivision of the Fort Ritchie Community Center. County staff is ready to complete the process of subdivision. The subdivision includes the Community Center building and 3.766 acres plus or minus at Fort Ritchie. An ingress-egress easement of 0.818 acres will be established when the parent parcel is sold to allow access to the center. Commissioners? So the new access, will that come off of the 3.766 acres? No. The, the, there's, a, there's an easement for the access, um, and that will get them public access to the, the main entrance there at the gate. Just That's a, all we've done is make sure they we don't landlock them, basically, right? It, correct. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is a procedural matter to make sure that um, as we're moving forward, uh, it, it's separated from from the larger Fort Ritchie parcel. I um, motion to support the subdivision. Second. First, I, let's, I have a comment question. Um, I know the community center and, and the community in general utilizes the parade grounds on a regular basis for a lot of events, fundraisers activities and um, I, I understand the need to section off the community center property obviously but I just hope we're not closing the opportunity or the door to the future of the parade grounds I know there's a, um, an easement that will not allow development on the property um, but I just want to make sure it remains open and accessible to the community center for their needs so I think it's been an ongoing discussion and we're here um, today because this is um, received plan, uh, com planning commission approval, and so there is a sunset period there. So this allows the recordation to happen, the actual subdivision to happen. Um, there's still an opportunity later to go back um, through a simplified plat process and adjust boundaries or um, create additional easements. So we've tried to communicate what we're doing. Buck Browning from the community center is here. So this is kind of step one to at least create the parcel. And I think your your point's well taken to continue the dialogue on that. Okay. Very good. Great. First and a second. Any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Five oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, Washington County Community Coalition request for support. Ellen, please introduce yourself. Good morning, Paul Fry, Washington County Chamber of Commerce. I'm uh, Jim Kirchville, Executive Director of the Greater Hagerstown Committee. Welcome. Uh, commissioners, again, we're here to uh, talk about the Community Coalition and to ask your continued support. We've had a, a great run. I think this is our 14th year to go as a community to Annapolis with an agenda on behalf of Washington County. Um, we appreciate your support in the past. And uh, as we've said year after year, the benefit we have in Washington County, we go to Annapolis, we're in one voice, we get lots of compliments from the General Assembly uh, for that, in particular with our uh, reception we have. 
So with that, I'll have Jim run through the, some of the county pieces of this and see what questions you might have for us. And uh, before I do that, I just wanted to thank uh, the county, the commissioners and staff who've been very engaged in the process over the last several months as we've put this agenda together. I appreciate all that support as well as uh, the staff time and sending me some memos that we're putting together, a booklet that we'll have here coming up uh, in January. But have, we're, we're way ahead of schedule. Uh, well, actually, we're on schedule, but it's ahead of what we normally do to try to have everything ready for the delegation meeting uh, here in early November. That puts us in a really good place to be well prepared for discussions here in January. Um, I know we've gone over all these before. There's not really any new items, so I don't want to take a lot of time to go through it. I just point out from the county's perspective, some of the county initiatives that were led uh, under the transportation column on the agenda that you've, you've received uh, will continue to um, advocate for funding for I-81 and I-7065 interchange. One of the new items added this year has to do with your public safety training facility. I think there's been some uh, good discussions with uh, State Highway about trying to get some funding to assist with uh, um, some of the uh, support for accidents on I-81 and 70 and the management of those accidents. Um, of course, our UIP project is, again, an ongoing project. However, the next two years is when uh, the bulk of the pledge from the governor uh, comes through or comes through the state legislature. Uh, we don't see any issues there, however, because of the size of those numbers in years four and five, totaling 4.5 million. We want to continue to advocate to keep that in the budget. Uh, anybody that was at the events last week uh, certainly see the fruits of that labor, and uh, I think there's a lot of support downstate for that to continue. Um, in addition, uh, we're going to try again to, to work with sales tax exemption for the aircraft parts. Uh, we're trying to set up some time right now to meet with some of the other stakeholders across the st state that supported this issue. I do know this will be a little bit of a challenging issue based on the current fiscal um, position at the state and a lot of the funding that's gone to Kerwin. Our lobbyists have also already talked about any kind of issues with large fiscal notes will be a little bit of a challenge, but we made some progress with the discussion last year and we're going to conti continue to work on that issue. Um, other county events uh, under health. Um, I know uh, Commissioner Michael Schmidt uh, brought a lot of uh, um, acknowledgement around the Medicaid reimbursement issue. I know MAKO and, and MML, I believe, are supporting that. Uh, their leadership is, is huge in that effort. Uh, but we'll, we'll add that to our agenda as well and try to support that cause. Uh, pris the prisoner release bill, Delegate Quarterman put a bill in last year, but we'll continue to work on that issue to try to um, uh, eliminate some of the negative consequences of having the prisoner release in our area. Um, under watch list, uh, the highway user revenue, of course, is always always an issue that we're going to continue to follow. We've had some success on there, although I think the municipalities received a lot higher percentage of that uh, return of revenue versus the counties, but uh, still we're going to continue to work to support that. Uh, we're going to follow the Kerwin issue closely. That's going to certainly impact the county. I know the commissioners are well aware of that issue and, and are following that as well and what that could lead to as far as fiscal impact at the local level. Uh, we'll try to keep in touch with that uh, as well as the, the school construction component. Um, also, I know uh, uh, we're going to look at or we're going to include some exposure for the Dolman Black Heritage Museum. Uh, Commissioner Kiefer brought that in. We'll have a page that I've already received uh, that we'll put in the book. We'll also have a stand for them and a reception to try to uh, promote that as it's working towards a more permanent, permanent <coughs> facility. So those are kind of the summaries of the county-led initiatives that were put in there. Um, I would also point out, like we do each year, we try to get our agenda in place and keep that firm uh, so we could put the stuff together and work the issues. But it is a fluid document. If things do come out late, you know, we are certainly uh, stand ready to try to make adjustments as needed. That if that means add or, or change some of our items, we could do that. We certainly have a full agenda this year, and I think that's because of the engagement of our partners. Um, and uh, we, I know, uh, talked to John Favaza, uh, the lobbyist for Manis Canning, who will be representing us again this year. He um, has this information, excited about ready to go, and already starting to work some of the things behind the scenes to prepare for the 2020 session. So, Commissioners, questions, comments? 
again, we certainly want to thank everybody for their participation. It's gone smooth. It's gone really the last couple of years. Pardon me. There's a recommended motion to fund for ten thousand dollars to award ten thousand dollars. Is there a motion? I'll make the motion to award ten thousand dollars to the Washington County Community Coalition. I'll second it. I have a first and second. Any other comments? Questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very Thank much. You gentlemen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Good, yeah. luck. Good one. Best wishes. You. If you need anything, please don't hesitate. See you in Annapolis. <laughs> Next on the agenda, bid award, bulk delivery of road salt. Please come forward, introduce yourself. Good morning. Brandy Noggle, uh, Fire and the Purchasing Department. Uh, Zane Rao, Deputy Director of Highways. The recommendation I have for you this morning is for the bid award PUR 1443, the bulk delivery of road salt. Move to award the contract for the purchase and delivery of bulk road salt to the responsive responsible bidder, Morton Salt out of Chicago, Illinois, who submitted the bid price of 61.80 per ton. On August 16th, uh, the county issued an invitation to bid for the bulk road salt. The salt will be purchased on an as need basis. Annually, the county roads department used about 15,000 tons uh, to treat the ice and snow uh, on county maintained roads. The contract is for a period of one year and the recommendation today is just for the county's portion of the award. The city will make their own independent award. The bid was advertised in a local newspaper, the county's website, and e Maryland Marketplace Advantage website. Ten companies downloaded the document. We did receive five bids back. One was deemed, uh, n well, they had no bid on it. Funding is available in the department's FY20 operating budget. Looking for approval to make the award to Morton Salt once again this year. Motion to approve. Second. I have a question. Is it yes, sir. Salt delivered all at one time, or is it in shipments with 15 tons? Uh, typically, I'll just use Hagerstown. We'll start out with about 1,500 tons, so 20 to 22 ton drops, mm -hmm. uh, and then we order, you know, as needed. As needed. Does that is that shipped in by truck from there? Is that coming to Port of Baltimore? And it comes drop? in to the port, I guess, by ship. They unload it, and then dump trailers or tandems deliver it. Yes. Let me ask sort of unrelated questions. Your, your crew's busily now getting everything ready for winter, is that correct? Yes. Plows, vehicles, everything? Yes, sir. Trying to get to truck. There's no stone, snow on the ground. They're busy in preparation. <laughs> yes. Mm. Uh, primarily now it's in the, the mechanic shop, getting the trucks ready. Typically around the week before Thanksgiving is when we try to suit everything up. But yep. we still have good weather for black topping and projects, you know, as such. So we're trying to get as much of that done before we, you know, switch to winter mode, if you will. Okay. That's fine. Any other questions for the commissioners? I have a first and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Allegiant de-icing, anti-icing agreement. Good morning. Um, so we are looking to uh, move forward with the agreement. Um, this is signed on an annual basis to basically provide de-icing service, services for Allegiant Airlines. Uh, the pricing is uh, 120 per event plus, a, plus material estimated revenue uh, for the airport is right around $7,000. <coughs> we have worked, Kirk and I have worked with Allegiant to go through this agreement and looking for um, your agreement to move forward. Motion to approve the agreement. Second. Any other questions? First or second motion. All in favor, say aye. Aye. I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Passenger terminal expansion. Welcome back. Yes. Yeah, awesome. All right. So we are, um, the awarded funding is to reimburse Washington County for the purchase of two properties, uh, professional services for uh, Top Flight Airport Runway Visibility Zone, and also the Grove Farm Demolition, uh, the DVE Plan Update, and lastly, the construction phase uh, services associated with the terminal expansion. Uh, the two properties were previously purchased to protect the uh, navigational airspace for Runway 927. <coughs> the properties include 
14231 Oak Springs Road and 14235 Oak Springs Road and the Associated uh, Professional Services uh, ADCI for providing um, the land acquisitions. Additionally, funding is sought for professional services from ADCI associated with Grant 60, Top Flight Air Park Runway Visibility Zone, uh, Grove Farm Demolition, and the DBE Plan Update. This request is also includes construction phase services associated with the terminal building expansion. The Office of Grant Management has reviewed the grant application and funding guidelines. There is a matching requirement of 5% for Washington County, along with the 5% match provided by the Maryland Aviation Administration. Uh, the fiscal impact is a 5% match uh, for the county, which equivalates to $55,556, uh, which is approved in the airport's CIP budget. Commissioner's comments? Move to accept the awarded funding. Second. Uh, first and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Susan Buchanan is here. Move forward to the media organization funding. Please come forward. Good morning. Susan Buchanan, Director, Office of Grant Management, here this morning for consideration of expanding the community organization funding eligibility to allow capital expenditures in FY21. Um, the Washington County Community Organization Funding Grant Program was developed to implement a prioritized approach to funding local nonprofits based upon addressing community needs with a higher accountability, both programmatically and fiscally. Um, the program's guidelines currently consider requests for capital um, projects or assets as ineligible um, to define excuse me, define capital assets. They would be assets including land, improvements to land, easements, buildings, building improvements, vehicles, machinery, equipment, and all other tangible and intangible assets that are used in operations with initial useful lives extending beyond a two-year reporting period. Um, to assist in the discussion, I've identified some pros and cons to um, changing that um, eligibility or, or leaving it the same. Um, pros would be increased flexibility of the funding mechanism. There would be no um, restriction on what types of projects could be funded by the um, program. Um, addition, additionally, nonprofits that may receive funding from the state or federal um, government for their operations, it would, they may be now eligible to um, utilize the local program for some of their capital expenses. Um, it also would eliminate judgment calls by the committee if they have an application that may contain something that they're not quite sure if it, it would be a capital expense. Um, some things are quite obvious. Some may recall require a judgment call by the committee. Cons would be the, pro, um, the program is currently set up with quarterly disbursements. Um, they get their award announcement at the beginning of the fiscal year and then each quarter there is a quarter of what the reward would be disbursed. If you have a capital project or asset, there may be some difficulty for the organization if they can't forward fund that that purchase because they won't receive the entire amount of, of funding until the very end of the period they have to spend it. So that could be logistically an issue. Um, another um, thing that could happen would be um, there could be an increase, this is just projected, an increase in applications submitted for these different types of projects. Capital projects tend to be more expensive or may equally expensive, but expensive, um, with the funding amount um, staying the same, that could then in turn um, lead to more denials. Something yes, like I guess what I want to ask is, uh, I'm still not clear, I'm going to let the interested party tell me why, what's the, it seems to me you're taking, you're just creating more candidates for money, which is not a bad thing, but we only got so much money. But anyway, let, I'll let, I think court's the interested party, yeah, I think. Well, I won't say an interested party, but my, con my concern uh, with not having capital projects is that if this money is going to, the community organization funding is going to operational expenses, if we ever reduce that amount or, or change that amount, then we're reducing some nonprofits' operational expenses. 
and most grants are not guaranteed to be a reoccurring grant and why would not you not want to help a one-time purchase if it's a computer system or something a one-time purchase um, for a nonprofit I just don't think you we should be uh, limiting um, to operational expenses only um, that's that's my personal thought um, it's still leading the community the COF members um, to make that decision on what they think is good or bad or you know what are the best ones to do but I just don't think it should be all to operational um, expenses What's you know I guess as a devil's <clears throat> advocate I would think that uh, and this is just me talking but say this organization wanted needed desperately needed a vehicle mm -hmm. would that be an example uh, but if a 50,000 <clears> and we still only have let's just say I think we have less money this year than we ever had have don't we Sarah in that fund for the COF funding, yeah. only because of the removal of several organizations. What's the balance? Organizations. $774,000. So I guess, and maybe I'm off base here, but I guess if I bought you a vehicle and children in need or whoever, I'm just coming up with something, mm -hmm. needed this, maybe we run out of money before, even though it's a grant, I understand what you're mm -hmm. saying, Court. Every year you got to go for that same grant, but I mean... You're going to have to convince me at this and point. That, and that's the COF's recommendation. They could come and say, no, we can't give you 50000 for that vehicle. We'll give you 5000 for that vehicle. Yeah, but when you get that 5000 you're taking 5000 away from children. It's a community-free clinic. They're going to have to do an un another fundraiser. And uh, it, I don't support this expansion of it, it, it at all. It actually, at all. the thing is, is, let's say the children in need needed that money for a vehicle or need that mm. money for a building or something like that. Prior, they couldn't get that money for it. They can only get it for operational expenses. That same program that's getting money now has a bigger, they have different things and needs that they couldn't before they could get now. So I, I think it actually is helping those programs being eligible for different product, different avenues that they weren't eligible to get before. So I think it's actually expanding. It. I'm intrigued by the idea personally. Um, you know, use, using the example of the organization you gave in needing a vehicle, well, it's still up to that organization what their need is and what they want to apply for in terms of a grant. If they prefer to apply for operating money, they apply for operating money. If they prefer to apply for a capital project, that's what they apply for. So we're not dictating what their need is. We're just giving them, the way I see it, correct me if I'm wrong, we I can cover more of their needs. The list of projects that will be approved and dilute the program and folks and kids and older folks are needed of, of, of projects and money we're going to dilute with capital projects. Or then do we go back and take money away from the Commission on Aging and the Museum of Fine Arts to refund the status of the COF back to 1.6. Well, the money that we're, we're contributing to nonprofit organization hasn't changed. I it's just don't the amount in the line item has projects. changed. So. I wholeheartedly it was there at the beginning of this. I think we're starting to change the spirit and the intent of the COF, and I won't support it. So if you're calling for a vote today, you're welcome to make the motion, but it says for consideration. One question I, I have, if money is being asked for a capital project, mm -hmm. And maybe they're two years out, three years out for, let's say it's a building project. Where does that money sit in the meantime? Well, the the well, way the program is designed, they have one year to spend the money. Okay. So it would have to be a very short term project. What if we have eight hundred thousand at one time? I think last year we had one point four or five or something. There was one point seven, I Six, believe, seven. last year. So how do we get? But, how do we? How do we build that back up? We, one we didn't really take away not, from it. No, you just, yeah. We took that entire pool and you put majority of it went to the Commission on Aging and a small portion went to a line item. Well, you could mince hairs, but we did eliminate that out of the community funding. That money got transferred over to the general fund, and I voted for those two projects. So are mm -hmm. you suggesting we add more money to the COF funding to increase these purchases or allowable items as capital projects? Well, I think that would be in next year's budget. Would you be interested in if... I know, I think with this funding pool, we kind of have percentages. This much goes to right. children's causes, this right. much to... In August, okay. we presented that, and that was approved at, this, at the amount in, for this year. If we were to consider mm -hmm. that, should we put a cap on how much money would be available for capital projects, how much money for operating? But it does bring up a good point about using grant money for routine operating expenses, because if that grant runs out and expires, it's not renewed. That was my concern with the disparity grant in our budget this year. If that's not renewed in two years, that's a problem for us on a big scale. So I can see for a small organization, it's the same line of thinking. 
How many applicants do we average? Usually around 40. 40. And I did, preparing for this presentation, I went back to see what are the normal amount of capital expenditure requests we would receive. Normally, it's no more than maybe one or two a year. And that's also because they see that. But, right. But, but so, if we promote yes. it, you're going to get 10 right. or 12 a board, which right. will detract from mm -hmm. the other applicant's final award, which means. So, no, I think I think differently. I think that, you know, whatever organization, they could be looking at it and say, you know, I might, I couldn't apply for this funding before. I only could, only could apply for this, but I needed this. So I think the children in need or mm -hmm. whatever other, you know, nonprofit organization, I think it's expanding that pool and giving the COF committee a, a more latitude to give the money to whoever's need. So I, th I think it's broad. Well, if you want to call for a vote, you can make a motion today. Well, I want to I want to talk about before I vote. What about uh, it, it, it's you know we got to put some trust in the five people we appointed on that committee too. I mean we don't have a thing to say about a separate now if we want to change it, but. If there's five people, we can't tell them where to put that money. So I think there's some trust that has to be put in them, too. Is that, am I correct on that? Sure. We have the final vote. They recommend we have the final Yeah, well, I know, but they, they're the ones that very rarely do we go against. You know, we put the trust in them. On it was it was done that way in 2010 and 11, being a new commissioner. We were lobbied heavily for that one point, whatever a million it was, a million dollars. We found out there was no process or procedure. Uh, but, but, and I believe it was um, this... Commissioner McKinley and Callahan suggested this process to keep commissioners' interference out of it. But yeah, but if if we saw, I mean, there is checks and balances here. We put our trust in them, and like you said, we could we could override when it came back to us. We could change it. So if we saw something screwy, we could we could change it. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not ready to vote. I want to ask a couple more questions, but you know, I think it. it I, I would just the way I see it, and I wasn't here in 2011, but. It's still keeping within that same spirit that it's not the commissioners making those fine details. We still have that committee that would be making the recommendations, and they would be going through the application. Yeah, but it was a narrow so scope of projects. We're going to expand the projects with how much money remaining right now? Seven hundred seventy-four thousand. So we already have an average of thirty-nine or forty. You may increase your applications out to fifty or sixty. Um, for example, take ten thousand away from the community free clinic. They've got to do another fundraiser to make up that difference. And COF was never meant to fully fund anybody's budget or wish request. This was just another op option to supplement. Am I correct? And that's yes. that's that's what I'm agreeing to. If it's not meant to fully fund your budget, I, this I is just, operational money. You're expanding the list of projects, which would dilute the awards. Oh, I agree. You you could be expanding it, and I think that's that's what this money's for. So. Okay, what I'm hearing, we'd like to bring it back for more discussion. Is that correct? Can I say something? The application is set to be released November 1st. To be able to keep that schedule, I have to be able to release the letters and the notice of funding at, at the end of this week. So I say my opinion is something to consider I, for the next funding year is my recommendation. Well, then I'll make the motion to add capital, um, capital expenses into the community organization funding. Fails, fails. I second. Oh, I have a first Wait, and man, second. Wait, stop it. I just. You have a, I have first and a second. I need discussion. Will this require, I mean, to effectuate this, does this require a change to the bylaws? No. Or the it doesn't go to that detail in the bylaws. Okay. Yes. So, say the, give me a motion again. I'm just, uh, I make the motion to delete the uh, ineligibility for capital projects. When you look at eligibility or eligibility, well, it actually says what's ineligible, and it says capital capital improvements on the list. It says capital improvements are, are ineligible to receive community organization. So and, uh, I make the motion to delete. Or do you want you want that in there? In, right. in court, what project do you have in mind to submit? Submit. I don't have any projects. Well, I, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily fair. I'd just like to know if there's something out there that we're that's looming that could be a benefit. Well, I'm going to ask what. Uh, it is a benefit to our nonprofit. What particular project? I have a first and a second. Wait a minute, I'm not done talking. So hang on a minute. What about what staffs think? Come on, staff. We got Rob sitting down there and Sarah. Give me. So typically in capital, we do we do look at capital as one-time investments, and those those are a consideration. We look at those in our own budget as uh, reasonable expenses and not in operating. So uh, Commissioner Monel Schmidt's position was somewhat consistent with our budget budgeting process. 
However, the numbers are, are exactly the way President Klein described them. There's a limited pool of funds, and it will change probably the number of applicants. Sir, your con concurrence is based on what? It says you've concurred. Um, I have concurred just on the initial presentation itself. I don't take one side or the other. I would agree with um, Mr. Slocum that, you know, there is some validity to allowing capital with the operating as it would be less tied year over year to fund that amount. But like you said, Commissioner Klein, it is true that there is a limited figure there for what the county is going to appropriate. And so if you do expand that pool, you will receive more applications. And it is true that funding that was released to nonprofits before for operating costs may be pulled back and diverted to a capital project. So, so at, the, at the end of the day, though, we don't tell the nonprofits what project they should apply for. That's based on what their needs are. As they see it, their board, they decide what project. So that's if true. the board of a nonprofit wants to apply for a capital project, mm -hmm. that's their directive, not ours. Maybe if it would be more amenable, do we put a cap on capital projects? In terms of- I, no I don't support it at all being changed this year. Should be a next budget year cycle. Um, that's my point. I have first and seconds or any more discussion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 Three to two. Thank you. Three to three. Yeah. But I would like to recommend that come back for another discussion for next cycle. Perhaps okay. When we come back in, I come back in the summer for the. Yeah, amount, I would I'll urge that so we have more time to think about it instead of a 30 days yeah. notice for the deadline. Thank you. Sure. Now, is Mr. Holloway, to Ashley, do you want to come forward and, and introduce yourself and introduce your item? Good morning again. Ashley Holloway, Director of Planning, Review, and Permitting. I have with me Joe Baker, Deputy Director of Planning and Zoning. Uh, we're here before you to brief you on uh, how we plan to move forward with implementing into the zoning ordinance uh, Airbnb type of lodging. Uh, this lodging is taking place. It's taking place at residential homes, so they're not taking place at businesses this has happened at uh, someone's personal home or someone's rental property uh, basically Airbnb type lodging is someone's renting their either a room in their home or their entire home to a visitor for a small period of time uh, usually it could be someone who just doesn't want to be at a hotel or a motel uh, it could be groups of people who are meeting somewhere and they just want to have more privacy instead of being in a hotel where they're next to other people being noisy, making noise. I used to work at a hotel, so I know how that, that, that is. Uh, so as of right now, the way the zoning code is written, this type of a lodging is not permitted at all in Washington County. And we would like to change that because it is happening. Uh, according to airdna.com, which gives uh, statistics on Airbnb type lodging in the Washington County area, there are approximately 50 properties that are advertising for this type of lodging. And so it's out there, it's a thing, it's a popular thing now, and we just wanna catch the laws up to it. So uh, first off, you should have a sheet before you there. We need to create a term. Uh, other cities have, other cities and counties have termed it as short-term lodging or short-term short -term residential. Uh, there are some other suggestions there as residential paid lodging or house hotel or lodging hotel. But first we need to determine what we would like to call this type of lodging. Uh, Airbnb type lodging, Airbnb is a company, it's a booking company. So it's not the actual term for it. It's just a, a company, it's the most popular one. There are other ones out there, but that's the most popular one that, that, that people use. So we need to come up with a term first. And then once we come up with a term, we need to come up with a definition. Uh, like I said, uh, people are doing this in their residential homes, so we want to include the phrase residential building within this definition, because uh, this is what we're targeting. Because if it's done at a, uh, at a commercial building, it would either be classified as a hotel or motel. Uh, so again, so we definitely want to emphasize that this is for residential buildings. And we need to decide whether we want to include just detached homes or if we want to include semi-detached homes like townhouses or row homes. 
Uh, so that's something that you know we're looking for your guidance as well. And do we want to just have this for existing homes or do we want to have it for newly built homes? Do we want to allow people to just build a home just solely for this type of lodging? Um, so that's something that we need to think think about, about as well. So up to, up to now, are there any questions about the term? They, and the they don't pay hotel, hotel tax. Yeah, that's, uh, no, they do not. How do municipalities uh, charter rules fall in play with what the county would do? How would that work? How would the, the towns within our county? Yeah, but they match. We would we they match our, this, or they have their own individual opportunity. For that they will have their own individual opportunity. The county does not control zoning in the towns, so that's something that the towns will have to create themselves. I know the town of Sharpsburg have their own. That's what I'm leading. Right. Up to. Yeah, they have their own. Uh, definitely, the towns can follow suit once you know if something is a, a, approved for this. But again, it's it's to their own discretion. The, were the Jill were the permitted not permitted and special exceptions that's all according that's up to date of what or is that are these suggestions or these that's are suggestions a, suggestions so that's not necessarily what it would be okay so if air, bring me up speed here an Airbnb if there's one operating now do we even know it's in a it doesn't matter where it's that could be next to a Mack truck or Volvo typically or we, yes typically we don't know how how they're operating where they're operating when they're operating right it's usually complaint driven um it's this is going to be something that's very difficult to enforce to be quite frank because right. um it's residential and you know until people neighbors pick up on it that there's new people coming in every week um but then not operating a business in a place that's not zoned for business uh. this goes back to the discussion that you guys held about your legislative issues with the business license being tied to the um, zoning certification letters that's part of our problem right now is the fact that um, the business license is no longer tied to that so gotcha. they can typically go in get a business license start up their business and then when we find out about it now we have a problem because it doesn't conform with zoning that's one of the reasons we brought that forward to you for discussion right. is to hopefully tie that back together so that people don't get into this predicament yes that that is correct uh, what before you are suggestions um, and it is essentially a type of business uh, so that's why we have this suggested uh, zoning districts as as they are on the sheet there uh, the residential districts uh, we would like for that to be a special exception because it essentially is a business in a residential district. And uh, this way here, it could be, well, at least try to be more monitored in, in what's going on. We so will, for instance, if I saw a rural village and I want it up there under permitted, we can just move them around and, and hash it out. Yeah, right this is way, really I'm, for discussion yeah, for yes, you guys. Yeah. This, these are our suggestions based upon what we see happening in the community, complaints that we have received, um, questions that we have received from people who want to start this type of business um, and and just our general history with these type of businesses so what we're basically doing here today is bringing this forth to you to say we understand there's an issue we would like to have that discussion with you here's our suggestions if you feel strongly one way or another about one of these issues we'll, we'll happily uh, go through that and and talk to our planning commission with that as well that'll be the next step basically from this point we want to have a discussion with you about your concerns and uh comments but well, once then, but you know just once we change that then you go from uh if we change it and they become if we change it and they have to abide by these rules right yes, just yes, say we would. just change it just now well then you go to from residential to business which different fire codes Yes, they would have to go. So they then. could cost them. They have to put sprinklers in. Actually, it, uh, actually, that's more building. Pause good. for a moment, please. We've we've spoken to our code official about this. Both the fire marshal and the building code do recognize this as residential. So it would be accommodating the residential. So correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Rich. But if an existing home were to be identified as an Airbnb, it would not require putting sprinkler in because of that. Additional occupants. So, 
but in most cases, this type of of, of a uh, of a business in this type of an instance, unless somebody's going to take a dwelling and completely convert it, I don't see that being an issue. I would think it would stay residential if it's non sprinkler today, as long as there are only one or two guest rooms. Uh, even under the fire marshal's uh, requirements, they should be able to continue or to convert that to uh, an Airbnb short rental type without having to uh, go back through and do a sprinkler system or anything of that nature. Now, if they would do a complete renovation of the building, we would have to look at what they were doing and how they were doing it and to what extent that may require a sprinkler but in most cases an existing building even do even due to renovation would not require uh, a sprinkler upgrade i'd probably suggest that we have a presentation somewhere and you know in the f near future and i don't know but wouldn't that go to planning too first it would already did sort of but wouldn't it yes sir where we would go from this point is we would actually draft an ordinance amendment Right. Um, and then that would go to the Planning Commission for a public comment session. And then it would become come before this body again for a public hearing. So all you so it sounds like to me that I guess if the commissioners agree, you'd let them bring us something and we'll review it because uh, you're just asking us for a concurrence that it's okay to do that, basically. And, and taking any feedback that you have on what you see in front of you if you think we should be taking a different tact. You have your instructions clear, let them move forward. So, so any of this, uh, what's the end goal? The end goal was to be more flexible in allowing these types of businesses to happen. Uh, I believe that the... So if I wanted to lease my house for a week, what keeps me from doing that? Currently, what, lease what, for <coughs> what prevents you from doing that is the zoning ordinance. Um, technically, by law, you should not be allowed to do that. So that if we... I'm we not would allowed to rent my house out or lease my house? We, if or, you're in rental properties, you rent you rent your property or you lease your prop uh, your property out. That's the distinction, and that's what we're talking about here. Is to, we would have to make a definition that would be very distinct in difference between renting something out as a rental home versus a short term rental. That's the difference. There's there's short term rental. There's long term rental. Hey, you would have if you wanted to rent it out on a long term basis, or just have a sudden one week out of the year. That's that perfectly fine. You can do that. Um, what we're saying is, is that if you're doing it as a profitable business you're where you're renting it out different people up. each each time, each week. Well, it, how about, I, will we get a tax off of this? That is so for discussion, I believe, but, during the legislative session. I don't know that we're yeah. bringing that up. Kirk, can you help me okay. with that? Okay, and then the other question is, uh, if we were to support any of this, will any of this have to get through our delegation? The, the the hotel motel tax would have to go through if delegation, correct, it. Kirk? Yeah. But the, uh, this. Last year they tried to put a, a tax, on the hotel motel tax on Airbnbs. Um, it did not pass, but last year they did try to do that. Yeah. I, I haven't not, heard that it's going to return, but that's always a possibility. Yeah, yeah that may require further consideration. The CVB is currently doing a study as to whether the hotel motel tax should be should apply to Airbnb type uh, short term rentals. Now you wouldn't need any additional authority to exercise your zoning authority over this type of use. Okay. And then I just have one other question. Suppose I wanted to, uh, would this have any effect on me swapping a house with another party? Say I wanted to go to Florida for a month and someone wanted to come live in my house for a month, I'm gonna live in their house for a month. Would that have any effect on that? That's a good question. Um, it's all going to be in how we word the definitions and the terminology in this, and that's why we wanted to bring these concerns forward. We understand this is going to be a very complicated issue, and that's why we wanted to talk to you about this. Um, but the, I think what we are shooting for um, are the ones where they are basically uh, renting the house out uh, on a weekly basis or a daily basis versus uh, a monthly or yearly. I think the answer to your question, Terry, is going to be similar to what Jill said. It's complaint driven so that if and that's part of the reason why staff is bringing it, because we do receive complaints from neighbors sometimes 
And right now we, we're in a bit of a dilemma because we don't have anything that, that addresses this. So that's why we're trying to move forward according to the commissioner's will. And I also have a lot of uh, residents and stakeholders that actually call my office and ask that, you know, ask questions. You know, I'm interested in hosting an Airbnb type lodging. What do I need to do? And my answer right now is it's, it's not permitted. So, uh, so again, uh, it's out there. We know it's out there. We just want to, um, you know, tackle this this new type of lodging and and get some type of hopefully some type of, uh, uh, you know, type moderate somehow. The commissioners, I'm hearing you want them to move forward and bring back more information. I think that's a good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, contract award, investment grade energy audits. Please come forward, introduce yourself, and the project, and the contract. Good morning, Rick Curry, Director of Purchasing. Good morning. Good morning, Scott Hobbs, Director of Engineering. Some of you for you is contract award PUR 1439 investment grade energy audits. I recommend a motion move to award the investment grade energy audits contract and sponsor responsible poser Snyder Electric of Hagerstown, Maryland, who submitted a no cost proposal. Request for proposal was advertised in the Herald Mail on the various websites listed in the ARF. <clears throat> we received one sealed qualification <clears throat> proposal, which was reviewed by a coordinating committee that consisted of Washington County staff and Washington County Board of Education staff. <clears throat> the audit will, but a lot not limited to, replacement of an inefficient heating, ventilation, air conditioning, HVAC. <clears throat> also, you, you can see a list of county government facilities that will be evaluated under this program. And also, this project is a 150-day consecutive day project, which I know to proceed, which is in November 2019. I'd like to also stress that this recommendation is for county facilities only. We um, structured this contract differently than most performance-based contracts and contracts when it regards to energy. So this is investment grade energy audit to receive the audit first. Um, and then from there is in then the determination to move forward in the implementation phase depending on what we receive and the numbers um, looking at the different aspects of what cost saving measures there are what financial um, means there are to the projects and then moving forward so again there's a distinction with the way we've structured this contract commissioners questions comments The way our bid was put out, we asked for it to be for zero consideration. No, we did not. Okay. So I'm trying to wrap my mind around why nothing's for free in life, why this company would be interested in doing something for nothing. I assume it's because they have hopes of getting the, the work that results out of their proposal. That would be a possibility. During the RFP stage, there was consideration for a statement, and I believe it was included, that said approval of this particular document moving forward to all bidders would not obligate the, the owner, whether it's the Board of Ed or the county, to any future or further work after the proposal here is presented, after the next proposal after this is presented. Is that correct? Correct. We've structured it in a stepped phase approach to this, step or phase approach, which is um, perform the energy audits throughout the buildings, receive that report. It's going to be a, a, you know, a substantial review of all the county um, infrastructure, uh, building infrastructure, and then from there, the county or BOE could implement under separate contracts. No obligation, again, in this first phase or the first step of the contract to move forward with that same um, consultant. So we've, again, made a, a separate contract um, from, from the normal process so that we could, um, you know, take it in phases, take it in steps, moving towards that, no obligation moving forward with this um, consultant or not. And 
um, that's how we've gone. Or, or no consultant whatsoever as well, correct? Or no whatsoever. Any other comments, questions? Hearing none, there is a recommended motion to approve the award. Is there a motion to approve? I make the motion to award the investment grade audit to Schneider Electric. Is there a second? A second. I have a first and a second. Is there any more comments, questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 Three to two, motion fails. Thank you. Mr. Downey, would you like to We're going to recess to go to lunch. <clears throat> Julie. Yeah, before before you recess, I believe the commissioners uh, intend to reconvene in closed session to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice on a legal matter and to comply with specific constitutional, statutory, judicially imposed requirement that prevents public disclosures about a particular proceeding or matter. If so, be appropriate for a motion to go into closed session for those reasons as stated. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Lunch we go. And then you. <laughs>